In this video, we're going to start talking about our next method that we will analyze. This is going to be a way of finding the maximum value. By default, you likely will do this by creating a for loop and then analyzing that for loop. This is an interesting take on how to find the maximum in an unsorted array. We're going to talk a bit about how it works without necessarily checking all the specifics of the code, at least the idea of the algorithm, though. So let's suppose you have some array. 4, 6, 1, 3, 8, 7, 5. So it has some elements. What this is going to do is it is going to start and compare the first element of the array to the last element of the array. It compares them and then replaces the first element with the bigger of the two. So if the first is bigger, it will stay there. If the second is bigger, then it will replace it. So it will swap four and five. So swap four and five. And then it will compare the second element and the second to last element and swap them if the right one is bigger. So we're going to swap six and seven. And then it will compare one to eight and swap them if eight is bigger. And it turns out it is. So we swap eight there and one goes there. And then according to the algorithm, if we get into the specifics, it won't even look at three. It goes to n over two rounded down. So this entry here, which would be the fourth entry, will not get found because seven divided by two rounded down is three. However, it will then try to select max on the remaining elements in the array. So we'll try to find the maximum of the first four. So then we repeat it with 5, 7, 8, and 3. It compares 5 and 3 and makes the bigger one at the start, and then compares 7 and 8 and makes the bigger at the start, so we'll swap them. So we're repeating the same process. And then it will recall the algorithm on 5 and 8. It will compare the two and see which one's bigger. 8 is bigger than 5, so it swaps them. It then repeats this on the first half, so it repeats it on eight, and now we have one element, so we are in the base case and we return it. And if we look, eight was in fact the largest element in the array and it found it. So this finds the largest element by slowly pushing all the bigger things towards the beginning. This is a relatively interesting algorithm in that it isn't necessarily the obvious way to find the maximum, and hopefully it at least has a similar runtime to the way you would do it with just a basic for loop. So let's try to analyze it now that we have some rough understanding of how it works. So our first step in trying to analyze it is going to be right down our recurrence relation and the corresponding base case. So off to the side here, we know the base case according to the code is if n equals one, then return. So our base take case takes constant time. So we're going to say t of one is equal to c1. And then t of n for n that isn't equal to one. If we look at the code, we have a for loop that runs n over two times approximately, ignoring the rounding down. And inside it finds the maximum. Finding the max is a comparison and then potentially a swap, which is going to take roughly constant time. So the cost of that loop is going to be CN over 2. Plus, afterwards, it recalls the function with size N over 2. So it makes a recursive call of size N over 2. And here we're going to ignore the floor function. I want to introduce something that can be very helpful in these problems. If you notice, I called this CN over two. I am going to let C2 equal C over two. If I do that, I get T of N is equal to C2 N plus T of N over two. Notice by doing this, I have changed the problem's constants to make them more convenient for my own purposes. The constants were arbitrary anyway, so distinguishing between C and C2 isn't necessarily super important, but this can help us sometimes in analyzing things. So we now have a recurrence relation and a corresponding base case. We are going to label the recurrence relation. I'm going to put a little star next to it. So now we want to plug n over 2 back into star, which is a little different. So we need to plug n over 2 into star. To do that, we have t of n over 2 on the left-hand side is equal to c2n, but n is getting replaced with n over 2, plus t of n over 2, but n over 2 is getting replaced with n 
over 2. Maybe do a bit of algebra here to keep simplifying. We get t of n over 2 is equal to c2n over 2 plus t of n divided by 4. I'm going to move this over and off to the side over here on the right. We're going to keep updating our equation. We have t of n is equal to c2n plus replace t of n over 2 with the right-hand side of my substitution that I made. And I have c2n over 2 plus t of n over 4. We're now going to plug n over 4 into the equation. So we plug n over 4 into star. We get t of n over 4 is equal to c2n over 4. Combining those two steps that I had done before into a single step. And then plus t of n over 4 over 2. Do a bit of simplification here. We get t of n over 4 is equal to c2n over 4 plus t of n over 8. We then do one more substitution and replace t of n over 4 with our new expression in purple. So we get t of n is equal to c2n plus c2n divided by 2 plus replace t of n over 4 and we get c2n over 4 plus t of n over 8. And now, as we have done in our two previous problems, we want to try to identify some pattern that is occurring in these different equations. One thing is nice in this pattern, I think that is typical of these, where you have the thing inside of t should be relatively easy to identify. So down here in a different color, we're going to say for any value of k greater than or equal to 1. What do we have? Well, we're going to start by talking about the t term. So we have t of n is equal to something plus t of our things inside of t were n divided by 2, n divided by 4, and n divided by 8. So this looks like t of n divided by powers of 2. So n divided by 2 to the k. If you remember, the first equation is k equals 1. So that'd be n divided by 2 to the 1, checks out. Second equation is n divided by 2 to the 2, checks out. Third equation is n divided by 2 to the 3, checks out. The first term we mentioned is always, we expect, going to be a summation. So we have a sum. The things that we are adding up look like c2n over powers of 2. So we get c2n over powers of 2. The smallest such power of 2 is 0 because our first term is c2n, and the largest such power of 2 is one less power of 2 than appears inside of t. So it's going to actually be k minus 1 on top of the summation. And now we have our generic expression. We then want to choose a value of k to make this generic expression convenient. So off to the side, we're going to choose k such that the thing inside of t, which is n divided by 2 to the k, is equal to the base case, which if we look above, is 1. We then solve that for k. We get n equals 2 to the k, which means k equals log base 2 of n. Now, once we have k, we're going to substitute that back into our expression here, our generic expression. So we get t of n is equal to the sum from i equals 0 to log base 2 of n, after we do our substitution, minus 1, of c2n over 2 to the i, plus t of n over 2 to the k, but n over 2 to the k is equal to 1 by definition, so that's just t of 1. This t of 1 will simplify and just become c1, because that is what our base case is, and then we have a summation that we need to analyze. So we try to identify what type of summation it is. It's a decreasing geometric sum, which we usually analyze via bounding. So let's try that. So we are going to bound above and below. Let's do that down here. We need to bound above. If you recall, our technique for decreasing geometric sums was to bound them above by infinite geometric series. So we're going to factor out all the non-i stuff first and go i equals 0 to log base 2 of n minus 1 of 1 divided by 2 to the i plus c1 
and then we replace that top bound with infinity to continue bounding above. We change the top bound to infinity, and we write the inside as one number raised to the i plus c1. So t of n is less than or equal to c2n. We have a formula for our infinite geometric sum that is very convenient. That's 1 over 1 minus 1 half plus c1. And then we have t of n is less than or equal to 1 over 1 minus a half is just 2. So this is 2c2n plus c1, which hopefully we look at that and go, that is definitely in O of n. So that's our conclusion. So t of n is in O of n. And maybe just for our clarity, we will write off to the side what we do. We make uh, into infinite series. And then we use the geosum formula. Geosum formula. And then it's just algebra. So it is in big O of n. We need to show it's in big omega of n. Part of the reason for using an infinite geometric series is that the bound below is very easy. To bound it below, we bound the sum below by the first term. There's a bunch of ways we could do this. We could just look at when we were doing our expansion, the first term of the sum is definitely C2n. Also, if we plug into the sum i equals 0, we definitely get C2n. So we bound it below by dropping every single thing except that C2n. Thus, t of n is in big omega of n, and we can conclude that it is in theta of n. Therefore, t of n is in theta of n. And just as we have suspected from our original claim about how we could find the maximum, this takes theta of n time, which is exactly what the for loop to find it would do as well. This is an alternative implementation for finding the max, which is a little interesting because probably not a way you would typically think about doing this.